We thank the Lord for the opportunity He's given to us to be at Bible Centered Fellowship. We have our we want to express our deepest appreciation to Pastor Jerry Carter, my good friend from many years gone back, enabling us to be able to make this DVD presentation. Now what we're going to be doing tonight, we're going to be looking at the oldest language in the world. The oldest language in the world. We're going to take the oldest existing civilization, continually existing civilization in the world, and we're going to take the old, oldest book in the world, which is God's Word. And we're going to bring these, uh, these two elements together, and we're going to find out that if we use our Bible, we can decipher many of the ancient messages in the Chinese language. The uh, reason that we are having this presentation tonight is to encourage all who see this DVD to pray for Taiwan. We believe with all our heart that God has put a, a, the Taiwan the nation, the, the uh, province of Taiwan, whichever, whichever uh, it, it happens, that God will use, use this nation to help people come to the Lord. We're going to look at some of these characters tonight. And we're going to decipher them. We're going to find out what all this chicken scratch means. Praise the Lord. Everybody said praise the Lord. Praise the, praise the Lord. Lord. Now the first thing we want to do tonight, I want to draw your attention to a scripture. I want you to look with me to the book of beginnings. Uh, Genesis. Hallelujah. And we're going to take the Bible. And we're going to use the Bible to interpret the Chinese language. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you this. That there are many, 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 many Chinese. By far, many Chinese do not know this great truth written in their language. The Bible teaches us in Acts chapter 14 that Paul is preaching. And he's saying that the Lord has not left himself without a witness. And we find that, that in this lesson we hope to discover that God does truly love the Chinese people. Someone once said to me, Brother Edmonds, I believe that God loves the Chinese people more than anybody else. And I looked at him and I said, Brother, why do you feel that way? He said, because he made so many of them. And he sure did. One fifth of the population of the earth is Chinese. And we're going to take some, some we're going to focus in on the Chinese characters tonight. We're going to use our Bible and we're going to decipher this chicken scratch. Praise the Lord. Everybody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. praise the Lord. Now I want you to open your Bible with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now I want you to have that thought in your heart as we start looking at at some of these Chinese characters. And at, uh, at the same time, I do want to say that every one of these Chinese characters that we have used, and there's hundreds of them, have all been traced back into its beginnings. The Chinese language, it's amazing, has never lost its elements uh, of meaning. It's always retained its meaning in its pictographs. And that's what we're going to look at, this great mystery tonight. And we're going to use God's Word, and we're going to open up the mystery of antiquity found in the Chinese language. First of all, I'm going to write a Chinese word right here. Now, I'm not going to tell you what this word is. I'm not going to tell you what it is, what it means. Uh, this Chinese word is pronounced za. Everybody say za. Okay. Now, that's chicken scratch to a lot of us, but we're going to decipher it. And we're going to find out that God's word helps us to understand about the ancient Chinese people as they used their religion as a point of reference to create their characters. Now we're going to take this character here and we're going to break it down into, into certain components. Do you see that cross? This cross stands for the number 10. We can, we can count all the way to 10 on one hand in Chinese. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Now many times, if they got two hands, they'd cross their fingers like this. And that stands for the number 10. Wherever you see this cross-like 
uh, radical in the Chinese language, it has a meaning. It means ten. Now, this word is pronounced shi. Everybody say shi. Okay, it means ten. Now, we're going to take that ten. You see this here. You see the cross. And you see under that, you see a plane. We're going to take the plane. And we're going to place it under that ten. Now, the character has a different sound and a different meaning. Now, it's pronounced Two. Everybody say two. Okay. Now this character means ground. Now there's reason in the Chinese characters, but you got to use your head. And you have to use it. Sometimes you have to stretch it a little bit. But it, it's our, our, our mental capacities, our uh, reasonings are, are very elastic. And, and nobody's going to get uh, psyched out tonight in this service. So I want you to look at this. You see the number 10 standing on this plane. That is the Chinese character for ground. Now, a lot of people can't see that. What's the reason behind it? Let me tell you the reason. Ten standing on a plane. Where do your ten toes spend most of their time when you're standing on the ground? Is that not right? So here, we're using Chinese reasoning, and you have got... You've got the number 10 standing on a plane. Your 10 toes standing on the ground. The Bible teaches us, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now, we're slowly beginning to unfold this character. As we go down underneath, we find there is a square. It's written like this. You see the square right here. That square is pronounced ko. Everybody say ko. Now, it means mouth. Mouth. And there are three things especially that we can do with our mouth. Number one, uh, we can eat with our mouth. Number two, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can speak with our mouth. Uh, number three, uh, we can breathe with our mouth. Especially if we're breathing into something. One service uh, had a man, a stand up, and, and you know, I think... About every, probably about every church, every congregation pretty well has one or two of these kind of people. And I, 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 I wasn't catching on to what he was saying, but he stood up and interrupted me so rudely. And he said, well, I breathe with my nose. And he took me totally off guard. And I felt, I felt so small because I didn't know where he was going. I didn't know what he was trying to do. And uh, he was trying to prove me wrong or something. I couldn't understand, but in, 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 in a flash... The Lord gave me a word to say to him. And I said to him, Brother, I want to see you try to blow up a balloon with your nose. If you do, you'll probably lose all your adenoids. Because the nose is not made to force air into something. But the mouth is, has a diaphragm. And we can force air into a balloon or blow a, a clarinet or uh, operate something, uh, wind instruments of all types. You don't do that with your nose. So, thank God for reason. Praise the Lord. He sat down to shut up. I love him. Here we find, The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils. Used his breath. Breathed into him. Used his mouth. To breathe the breath of life into this piece of clay. And it became a living soul. Now, we got a, this, this character, as we, we slowly begin, begin putting its parts together, you'll notice that there's a stroke right here. You see that stroke right up here? That's what's called in Chinese, it has a name, it's called pi. It really doesn't have any meaning, except it does signify movement. It does show movement. In a lot of Chinese characters, you'll find, find that little pi to signify movement. We find here that this, this little... A uh, little line that we put there signifies movement. Now, any biologist knows that if anything is going to be deemed to be alive, to be living, it must move. Breathing is not enough. Iron breathes. Iron takes on oxygen. But it don't move. And there are several conditions that have to be met. Uh, these uh, uh, biologists 
they know the conditions that must be met and one condition that must be met and you can't have an exception to the rule it must move if it don't move it's not alive now here we're looking at a new character this character is pronounced God everybody say God oh. now what it means is to talk to speak we have this character and it, it signifies to us that there is life and that this, this life can speak. And the meaning is that when Adam was created out of clay and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, Adam could move. He became alive. And not only that, but he could talk. He could use his mouth to speak. And we find, we find places in the scripture, especially in the second chapter, where he named all the animals of the earth. And, and, and he's not talking about Tom, Dick, and Harry, people. He's talking about the species and the genus and, and all these things. So it's highly evident that when he was created, that he could use his mouth to speak. Hallelujah. Now, we also find out on the left side of this character is another radical. This radical has the meaning of to stand upright, and walk on two feet hallelujah just like the Bible says now this don't prove the Bible but the Bible shows that the ancient Chinese people when they were developing their language they want to develop a language they knew how to say it they said da but it, 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 it had to have it had to have meaning to it and they drew these pictures to show the meaning of this word. Now I'm going to tell you what this word means. This word means to create. It means there's an intrinsic meaning here. That when God created Adam. Adam was not a one-celled amoeba floating around in the sea. Washed up on the shore. On the shoreline. Grew a tail. Got up into a tree and come back down. Lost his tail. No. Not on your life. He was a man, just like we are today. And we see that the ancient Chinese people, they threw evolution right out the back door, simply on the merits of their characters and the meanings that they have. Hallelujah. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. That word form in the Chinese language uses this very word, and the meaning of this word is to create. Here we find that the Chinese people have used Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the story that's found in God's Word to describe what they would like to pin on paper. There's a lot of things we don't know about the Indians. And the reason we don't know much is because they didn't write. They just had a spoken language. But here what we're looking at today is a written language that would lock the meaning of of that ancient people and would carry them forth even to this day and age 4,500 years ago all Chinese linguists agree there's no disagreement on this all agree that the Chinese language began to be developed 4,500 years ago you look in your Bible and you'll see that puts you very close to the time of the Tower of Babel and we're going to be looking at that here in just a minute Let's look at another word. We find here this word for create is a memorial to the highest order of all of God's creation when God created man. Now we have another character here, another character that we're going to write. This character is written like this. This is, character is pronounced yen. Everybody say yen. Yen. Now what this means is garden. Okay? It means garden. Now, we're going to break it down. And we're going to use our Bible. We're going to use God's Word as a key to unlock this ancient language. Praise the Lord for God's wisdom. Hallelujah. Let's look at this here. We're going to break this down. I don't believe anybody would ever complain about having a fence around, uh, around your garden, especially if there's a lot of deer around. Because they, they seem to like carrots and cabbage and all those things that we like. And uh, if anybody lives around where there's a lot of deer, it'd pay to put a high fence around it. Here we have a fence 
around this word meaning garden. Underneath, inside, we have this character. Do you remember what that meant? Ten. Okay. And we take that ten toes and stand it on the ground. Now, as we go underneath, we continue writing the same pattern here that we find in that character. And we find another character. What did that mean? Mouth. When we look at this, we cannot help but feel there's a, an emotion. That something is being created. Because it is so close, closely written here to this character. Now, the emphasis, we're going to continue writing, and many times in the Chinese character, the last stroke, or the last part of that character, it will, it will signify and lock that meaning for thousands, thousands of years. Here we have another character underneath. You see this character here. This is the character that we uh, Chinese write for man. It means man. We take this character here, and we write it like this, and we see a small man coming out of the side of another man. Amazing. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. We find this man coming out of the side of another man. Hallelujah. We close up this radical, and we have here the radical in its written form, which means garden. Now, I've asked this question many times. Why would that mean garden? I get all kinds of answers. Well, Adam was created in the garden. But Adam was not created in the garden. Our Bible teaches us that God created Adam out of, out of the dust of the ground. And then he planted a garden. And after he planted the garden, he put Adam in the garden to keep it and to dress it. While he was in the garden. Now I want you to look with me in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I want you to, to look at verse 8. Chapter 2 and verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward and in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. We move over. We move over. We come down to uh, the bottom part. The Bible teaches us in verse uh, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And then as we continue moving down, moving down uh, further uh, uh, in, in, the, in the scriptures, the Bible teaches us that in verse 19, it says, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. In verse 18, he says, And the Lord said, Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help, meet, or fitting, proper, suitable for him. We find, uh, as we go... As we continue to go down, verse 21, And the Lord God formed a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib on the side, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. The Bible teaches us that in verse 23, this is, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Praise the Lord. So we find here a word that in the Chinese language that is depicting a man coming out of the side of another man. And we have the abbreviation for creation. So we know that something was created in a garden. It was Eve. Eve was created in the garden. Adam wasn't. So when the ancient Chinese 4,500 years ago were trying to find a word for garden, how to write it, they didn't use phonetics like G-A-R-D. They didn't use their, their ABCs to try to form it out. They drew pictures. And these pictures, every one of these radicals have their own separate meaning. And only if you use the Word of God can you break this code. Hallelujah. Yeah. We use these characters to preach the gospel to the Chinese people. And it's amazing to see the expression of unbelief, sometimes of utter, utter amazement to see that they've been writing all their life.
the Chinese language and don't know it, but the Chinese language itself tells the stories that we find in the Bible without one exception. Hallelujah. Everybody said praise the Lord. Let's go to another character here. We're going to go to another character. Okay, here we're going to another character. Before we go to this one, let's read our scriptures, okay? Let's look at the scriptures of God. Hallelujah. We're not doing this to prove the Bible true. We're using the Bible to unlock the Chinese language. Praise the Lord. If we never had this language, we don't need the Chinese language to prove the Bible. We don't need nothing to prove the Bible's true. Praise the Lord. But it's fascinating to be able to see how that the ancient Chinese people, how they use their religion as a point of reference to develop their written language. Now, I want you to look at this with me in Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. The Bible teaches us in verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in India, Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, in these early days, there are four prominent trees that we do find. Uh, we, find that, uh, we find that when Adam and Eve sinned, that they used the leaves of the fig tree. We know that the fig tree was in the Garden of Eden. We know also that when Noah, uh, Noah, when he uh, was preparing to leave the ark, he sent out a dove. And it brought back an olive leaf. These are trees, ancient trees that still exist to this day. But here what we're looking at in the Garden of Eden, there are two trees mentioned. One is the tree of life. The other is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're going to take this, this character right here and we're going to decipher it. We're going to unlock its message. Hallelujah. Everybody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to take this word, first of all, it's radical. This radical is pronounced mu. Everybody say mu. And it means wood. And all good wood comes from trees. We find that if we put another tree there, or wood, radical, it becomes lean. Everybody say lean. And it means forest. So it's, it's, it's evident that these two characters are two trees. Now, underneath these two characters is another character. It's written like this. That is the character that means revelation. Everybody say, sure. Okay. We got lean. We got mu. We put another mu in there and it changes it to lean. We put a sure underneath it. And now it means, it has the uh, meaning, uh, it has the meaning of to forbid. A revelation concerning two trees. We find that there is a revelation. Anything that God wants us to know, He tells us. And whatever He tells us is a revelation. The book that we esteem so highly is a revelation. It's God's message to the human race, helping us to understand how God feels about us, how God feels about this world. Praise the Lord. And we find here the, the radical that means to forbid or no trespassing. Now I want you to look with me in chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2. I want you to look with me. In verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. Forbidden. The, 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 the meaning of to forbid is there. And it's the first time that God ever said no to us as a race. And it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. 
for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, this is a revelation. If God had not said that, Adam would have ate that tree unknowingly, and God would not have been justified in, in penalizing Adam for eating the fruit of that tree. But Adam was not without a revelation relative concerning two trees. Hallelujah. And here we find the same word that many of you men, you see when you're, you're out hunting somewhere and, and you'll see a sign that says no trespassing. When you're in China, you see a door that has this character written on it, don't go in because you're liable to come out with a bump on your head. This is the word that means no trespassing or to forbid. And we find our Bible unlocks the meaning of this ancient Chinese character. Now, we're going to take that revelation. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise now, we're going to take that, that, that bottom character off. And we're going to put something else under it. We're going to put another radical. That radical is the radical for woman. Okay? Now, we've got a woman that's looking up at these two trees. Now, I want you to look with me in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she saw it. And it was pleasant to the eyes. Strange in chapter 2, it's turned around. It was pleasant to the eyes and good for food. Here, here, it's different. If the tree is good for food and pleasant to the eye, there's a special meaning in the way that that's written. It says, And the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Here we have a character, a woman, looking up at two trees. One of these trees God gave to her. The other tree belongs only to God. But Eve wants it. She wants something that does not belong to her. And this Chinese character is pronounced lan. Everybody say lan. And it means to covet. To covet means to want something that don't belong to you. Thou shalt not covet another man's wife. Because she belongs to someone else. She does not belong to you. So here we find another character. Unlock people. We could go tonight in this service, go until tomorrow, six o'clock in the morning, and we still wouldn't be through. Chinese language is full of these characters, and I want to reassure you that every one of these characters have been carefully, carefully checked to make sure that from the very beginning they did not change. Four thousand five hundred years. Can you believe it? Never changing the meanings. Here, we're going to go and look at another character. Remember what that was? Woman. And then, we finish it up like this. This is the radical, the word, the character that means beginning. A beginning. Or to begin. Now, we're going to take this character... And we're going to write it like this. The character, the radical for a woman. Now, on the top right side, you'll see another radical up here. Do you see that? It's written like this. And it's pronounced S. Everybody say S. It means to sneak. It means to do something without other people knowing it. And as we continue writing this character, we have this square... And we find that this square means what? Mouth. Here we find a woman sneaking a bite to eat. Now you say, Brother Edmonds, how do you know that that's what that means? Because the ancient Chinese character, even though, even though they have undergone some changes in the way it's written, but the components are all there. The ancient Chinese character for mouth is written like this. It's written like this. You've got an opening, and fruit is being dropped into it. 
a woman secretly sneaking a bite of something to eat. Beginning. Why would this radical, the Chinese people, we are going into the Chinese mind. We're going into the ancient Chinese. Why would they write begin with this character of a woman secretly taking something to eat? Because this is the beginning of sin. That's where sin began. A woman stealing, taking something didn't belong to her. And it seems to indicate here that when she done it, that Adam wasn't around. She done it by herself without any counsel from her husband. So we find here the ancient Chinese word for beginning. Now, our time is limited. This DVD that we're making, we hope that it will be a blessing to the churches here in the United States. We hope it will be a blessing to the Chinese that are here in the United States and that they will be able to see their language opened up before their eyes telling them of the love of God showing them that God does care for them that God does care for the Chinese people and he's left a testimony and a witness for 4,500 years in their language there's no language on the earth that's ever had anything like this happen to it we're going to look here we're going to go on some of you are probably already wondering, my, how in the world would they, would they have this knowledge? The Chinese people, a bunch of idol worshipers, dragon people, you know. Well, they weren't always dragon people. There was a time when the Chinese people, when they served a living God, and I'll show it to you here in just a little bit. We want to show this to you. We're going to find out tonight. We're going to find out. Sorry, I wrote that character a little, a little too loose. I should have written it first down here. It's okay. I can still get it. Save it. Okay. From this character, we begin to understand how the Chinese... Now, they're... There may be some conjecture here. There's a lot of silence. I mean, there's a lot of silence in the book of Genesis. Sometimes silence speaks more than anything else. You ask somebody, if they, do you love your mommy? Do you love your dad? And they don't answer. They probably got some reservation. They're telling you something. You never said a word. So we find here that there is silence in, in, in this, uh, this Bible lesson. And we want to break that silence. We want to try to break that silence if we can tonight. And wherever you see this character, it don't matter. A vessel, the uh, uh, ocean-going vessel, uh, air, airlines, uh, even the GPS, global positioning system, they have this character in it. That character has the meaning of traveling. It has the meaning of carrying something. In fact, this is part of the word that's used for Noah's Ark. Ah, yeah, things are beginning to click a little bit here. So we find here that we've got a, we got a word uh, that is it's a vessel. Up here, we got another character. It's the character that means eight. Seven, eight, nine, the number eight. Now, when it's printed in the newspaper, sometimes it's printed like this. But the written form, the ancient form... Is, is written. When people write it, they write it like this a lot too. So we have here eight. And then what was this? Eight mouths. And here in this part of the country, you probably say, how many cattle you got? Oh, I got about 200 head. You say, well, how many people in your family? Oh, I got about three mouths to feed. You know, the mouth can also stand for a person. Thank God we only got one of them. In fact, the word for population is written like this. People's mouth. That's the word for population. Because everybody has one mouth. Hopefully. Okay. Here we've got a word. This character. The meaning of this character is boat. 
or ship. Now I want you to think. You got to think. You got a navigating vessel. And you've got eight people on that vessel. And this is a ship. Now this ship happens to be the largest ship that man had ever made up until World War II. There was never a ship that was ever made that would exceed the, the size and limitation in, 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 in its length and its width and its height bigger than the ark that Noah built. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, it was the USS Missouri in World War II that was built according to that, those dimensions and it became known as the most stable ship in the United States Navy. Praise the Lord. God knows what he's doing, don't he? Hallelujah. Here we find also there is a possibility because in history we can't find any other ship. This apparently was the first one. A water vessel. A vessel that would float on water. Hallelujah. And this particular vessel, what made it so special, it had eight people on it. The word for ship. Now, as we look at this, we're getting a, an idea of where the Chinese got these sacred, if I could say that, characters. Okay. Let's look here. There is, a, there is another character. That we want you that we want you to look at. There is a there is a character that is uh, it's written like this. Now I'm gonna write it up here. So for you that want to write it, you can write it a little bit slower. Okay. This character is pronounced yen. Everybody say yen. And it means to continue. A continuation. Anywhere where there's an idea or concept of something not dying out but continuing on. Here we find the water radical in eight people. It was eight people that brought the human race in everything from, from the antediluvian age over into the, the uh, period of time that we call after the flood. There were eight people that brought Everything that we know across the flood. In other words, the human race and the things of the beginnings. These things were known by eight people. Now, the Bible teaches us. I don't think we have to go to the scriptures in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 13. The Bible teaches us that these eight people was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Eight people were on that ark. A historical fact. Now, also, we have an indication. We don't know. There is some conjecture here. But we have an indication to this character. And we'll write it like this. This character is the word for cave. And it's got the number eight. Above it, is the radical it means roof so it's very probable that when when Noah stepped off of the ark that he spent his first night in caves motel that's very possible we don't know we don't have no scriptures but it is fascinating to see that radical eight with a roof over their head and it means cave everybody say praise the Lord Praise the Lord. People, we can go on and on and on. I'm, I got one more character I want to show you, but before I do, I want to bring this thing in its proper time frame, its pr proper context. I want you to understand me. That from the time of Adam, Adam lived. I have my, I have my notes here. From, from the time of Adam to the time of of Abraham two years before he was born there were three people that lived to bridge history one was Adam Adam lived to be 930 years old and he died when Lamech was he lived 56 years 
into Lamech's life. Now, let me say this. If there's anybody that sees this DVD, and you find out that I'm wrong on my figures, you better give me a telephone call and let me know. Because I've done my dead level best to be able to make this as accurate as I know. Call me. Write me. Let me know. And I'll, I'll, I'll dump all the others, and we'll start over again. But we must be accurate. Fifty-six years into Lamech's life, Lamech was the father of Noah. Now, my notes, my notes show me that Adam, he died 126 years before Noah was born. But Lamech was the bridge between Adam and Noah. So Noah, of course, by, directly by mouth from his own father, was able to hear the things that Adam had told his dad. The Bible teaches us that Noah was a preacher. He was a preacher of righteousness. Somewhere around 120 years. The Bible teaches us that, that uh, Noah was righteous. He was just, perfect in all his ways. A very special man. We probably can't say that for his sons. Probably can't say it for his wife or his, his daughters-in-law. But we do know that Noah had a handle on the things relative to obedience and loyalty to the things of God. Hallelujah. Now, as we look, as we look, and I've I got my notes here. As we look in Genesis 5, and verses 3, and 30, 3 to 32, we find that there are ten men that are famed in the Old Testament. It starts with Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalaliel, Jared, Enoch, who Jude 14 says was the seventh, from Adam, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. The Bible, if we we'll take these, these dates, when they were birthed, they're born, when they died, we find out that when the flood came, that all of the east men died before the flood. Methuselah died in the year of the flood, his name in the year of our Lord. Lamech died five years before the flood came. Noah, 500 years old, he gave birth to three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Something to consider here. Our, our Chinese Bible makes makes Japheth the elder. Our English Bible, if I'm not mistaken, makes Shem the elder or vice versa. I get confused being in these two, two worlds in which we live. But the Bible teaches us that the floods were on the earth for 370 days. Some people may say, think it was 375 days. We know it was for one year and an additional 10 days. Now there is possibility that that year was not a 365 day year but that it was a 360 day year. So it don't matter a difference in five years when we're talking about 4,500 years ago. That don't, that don't really have anything to do with our lesson tonight. We find that Noah was a man that reverenced and feared God. People stop and think. Let's look through the eyes of Noah. Here's a man that was apparently a very wealthy man. Took a lot of money. Money built a boat the size he built. And I doubt very much I really doubt very much, personally speaking, I doubt very much of him and his three sons made this. Too big. Must have been very wealthy men. Must have hired it out. That's probably the reason that, that, that he is wicked generation didn't burn it down. Even though it was a big joke. But I mean, when you're making, uh, you're making $5,000 a month, man, just, you know, no one wants to be stupid. That's fine as long as we keep bread on the table, you know. So it's probably the reason that that wicked generation didn't cut his cut his work, his, the, the work of his hands, didn't cut it down because they were all his hired hands. So Noah must have been a very wealthy man. God must have blessed him exceedingly. Now that's conjecture. We don't know. But what we do know is that when, the, when Noah was 500 years old, he gave birth to three sons. Now were they triplets? Who knows? At 500 years old, he gave birth to three sons. Terah, when he was uh, uh, a Bible, teaches us Terah, when he was 70 years old, he gave birth to three sons. But we know that uh, they weren't all born at the same time because Abraham was 75 years old when, when his daddy died and he went down to Canaan land. And we know that daddy gave birth to, to Abraham when he was 130 years old. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 11 that uh, Terah, gave, at 70 years old, gave birth to these three sons. So 
we, we really don't know, but we do know that uh, he had a he had hundred years to, to birth these, these three sons. Okay, now, we're trying, to, we're trying to grasp a time frame here. If you look, look in your scriptures, you look in the Bible, you know, it, there, there's so many jewels in, in, in Genesis if you just dig. A lot of people, they, 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 they think that when Jacob left his mama, he's just a little boy. But he couldn't have been any more or uh, any less than 77 or 78 years old. And he's still hanging on to mom's, mom's dress, dress string. Big man. You know, we don't have time. We don't have time. He, he, he got married. He got married uh, uh, years later, seven years later, man. Eighty-some years old before he got married. Yeah. Okay. So we find in the genealogy, you find a lot of, a lot of things. But we do know one thing. That on the 600th year of Noah, on the second month, the 17th day, until the 601st year, the second month, the 27th day, that the floods came and were dry. It took 370 or 375 days to use the flood to destroy the human race. Okay. The Bible teaches us, and I want, uh, you, you've got to get this, people. Noah feared God. That's a lot, a lot more than what we have today. Noah was afraid of what he might see. He, he wouldn't look outside of that ark. Even though he took the window out, put a raven out, the raven just kept flying. Hey, all he had to do, he just wanted to see if the water had receded. He wouldn't even look. Now you stop and think about this man and how holy, how he feared God. And the Bible teaches us that days later, days later he sent a dove out. And sent the dove out and uh, the, dove, uh, the dove come back. And then he sent the dove out again. I mean, all you got to do, man, just take just a little peek. You know, just one look, man. God, just take one look. It's all right. But Noah had the fear of God in his heart. He was very careful about what he looked at. And I'd use this tonight to tell you, you need to be careful what you're looking at too. Because a lot of people have no fear of God and looking at things they shouldn't be looking at. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry. My preaching's coming out on me. I'm going to have to hold myself here. Praise the Lord. He was very careful not to look. He wouldn't even peek. Man, I mean, just one eye, half of it, you know. You just got half of your pupil. You, you could see he wouldn't even take one gander. The reason I'm saying this to you is to show you that Noah was a man that feared God. Now, Noah lived to be 950 years old. We know that after Noah, he spent one year, one year on the ark, and that makes 900 I'm sorry let me let me start this again when the floods came Noah was 600 years old he was on the ark for one year and that makes 601 the Bible teaches us that he lived to be 950 years old so what we have here is 349 years after the flood that Noah is still around. Now, people, we're going to look at this so we can appreciate it, and we can understand what the Chinese, what the Chinese people were faced with in that hour. We find that if you look in your in your Bible, turn with me in your Bible, Genesis, Genesis chapter ten, and verse twenty-five, and under Eber, which is the father of the Hebrews were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. His name means division. For in his days was the earth divided. Now, we look over, we go over into chapter 11 and we find out, we find out also in, the, uh, in verse 18, and Peleg lived 30 years and began rule. Okay, now what we're looking at here is a genealogy of Shem. We're looking at a genealogy of Shem. You can see it from, from verse 11. Shem lived after he begat RF, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, yeah, verse 11. 
10. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old. And we get Arphaxad, Arphaxad, two years after the flood. You got two years here. We go down. That's two years after the flood. You have to add that up. So put two down. Then later, we find out that Arphaxad lived 35 years. And he begat Salah. And then we're going down. In verse 14, Salah lived 30 years and begat Eber. And then we're going down. And we find in verse 16, Eber lived 34 years and begat Panic. Now, people, you can mark this down. A lot of people say, well, there's people missing in the genealogy. Not this one. Because you're going from birth to birth. You're going birth to birth. It doesn't matter how old they lived. What matters is what happened when they gave birth to a child and then when, the, when the, that child gave birth to another child. And you can calculate 101 years. What I'm trying to tell you is if Peleg his name means division. If that refers to the Tower of Babel, and there are innumerable Bible scholars that believe this, that means that the Tower of Babel was built 101 years after the flood, or at least they were scattered. People were scattered across the face of the earth. People, that's not very long. So you take 600, 601 years, and you, you add 101 years to the Pelech. And some people say, well, it was in the midst of his days because he lived to be 200 some years old. Well, he, he, he was named. You don't give a child a name after he's lived 100 years. He was named Pelech because in his days, when he was born, the, the, the earth was divided. People were scattered. Here we find that Noah, during the Tower of Babel, 702 years old. What I'm trying to say to you people is that the Chinese characters, the time frame for the Chinese characters trace back to the time of the Tower of Babel, the same time frame, and Noah is alive. And he lived on into, uh, 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 into Terah's life in two years. When Terah was 130 years old, he gave birth to Abraham, and when he was 128 years old, Noah finally died. So what I'm trying to point, I'm trying to make, is that when the Tower of Babel, when this mess happened to the human race, Noah was still alive. Now, if you look, you look at at the scriptures in in verse 11, uh, chapter 11, Genesis. The Bible says in verse 4. And they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Can you believe that? <laughs> the Bible teaches us that they had as their motive to build this tower that would reach unto heaven. Let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They were planning to build a tower that would reach to heaven. Now, let me tell you this. In all of my studies, I have never found anyone to this day that can give a logical explanation for what they were trying to build that tower for. I haven't found any yet. And until I find something that would lead me to believe otherwise, I cannot help but believe that they were responding to the preaching of Noah because of their sin, because of their pride, because Noah feared God, and apparently these people didn't. And they were actually uh, confused enough to think that they could build a tower that would reach into heaven. God looked down on that mess and cursed him. Scattered him. Begin talking. Begin, uh, everybody begin talking in another, in another language. They couldn't understand one another. Hey, they didn't know. You know, somebody says, well, how about this brick? You know, and then they, you know, you have to got to go through one word after another. Business, it's, these construction projects could be slowed down quite a bit. Noah's alive, people. 
And it's strange. Let me just share this with you. This is conjecture. I know it is. And if you don't agree, that's your decision. You can do whatever you want. But my experience tells me that nearly everything we do is a, is a reaction to something. You look out these traffic lights on the, on, the, on the streets, on the roads. When cars were first made, they didn't have traffic lights. But they come because they found out, man, if you don't get some order in this traffic, you're going to get some people killed. There's a lot of stop signs. There's a lot of uh, red lights here in this city. And, and uh, we go down and just stop so many red lights, and we probably just feel so frustrated. They go, why? What's the purpose of having, having this light here? Well, what we don't know is that several years ago, somebody died there in an accident. And if they don't put a light there or something there, you know, well, the guy might lose his office, the mayor or whoever it is. The only human structure, man-made structure, can be seen from, from the air, the astronauts, is the, the Great Wall. This Great Wall was built as a defense. Why? Because of marauding invaders coming down from the north. This house that we're worshiping God in has a roof. And the reason it has a roof is because it rained. And it has an air conditioner. And the reason it has an air conditioner is because it gets hot. And it has a heater is because it gets cold. There's a reason for everything. And my contention is why would they want to build that tower? I mean, everybody's already building cities. Nineveh, Nimrod, and whatever. Nineveh been, been built. Big cities, great cities. I can't, you know, these cities been built. But why build that tower? You stop and think with me, if you will, please, tonight. I don't want to jeopardize your freedom, uh, your freedom to think like you want to. But just think with me just a minute. My Bible teaches me Noah's a preacher. He preached 120 years. I'm going to tell you something, people. If I had to preach 120 years, the only people I had, the only saints I had in my church was my family, I think I'd give up. Yet God looked upon this man, let him uh, take this ark ride for one year across this, this great flood waters and set him down, Mount Ararat, come down, and the human race began to uh, become established once more. But we can tell from the context of the scriptures that that generation was a wicked generation. God was upset and angry with them because of the pride of their heart. Now, they wanted to build that tower to reach unto heaven. Now you stop and think. Noah was afraid on that ark. He was so afraid. He had such a fear in his heart. He wouldn't even look out the window. I'm sure he must have heard the screams of, of, of lions and tigers eating people as everybody's rushing for the high ground. If you have any knowledge of a holocaust, you look into those gas chambers and it all is is a pile of flesh and blood while everybody's trying to scratch for high ground and get their last breath. Noah probably knew what it was to hear people beating on the work for you so hard. And, and, and I, I'm a loyal servant, and I helped you, and I stood with you when everybody else wanted to burn the thing down. And, and Noah, just take my son. Noah couldn't do it. God shut the door because he had enough humanity in him. He couldn't. He couldn't. Uh, he couldn't take it. So God shut the door. Now, why would they want to make that tower a tower? But why go to heaven? You stop and think. Could it be? That they were reacting to the preaching of Noah? He was telling them the fearful things that happened in this flood. Telling them the, 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 the cries and the snarls of these animals and, and all of the blood and the guts and everything. And, and he could hear it from, from his ark and it just, it, it just put such a fear in his heart. And I can see Noah preaching to that evil generation. And I can see them also turning around and saying, well, you're not so big even though you are great granddaddy. We're going to build. We got a solution. We're going we're to save ourselves. We're going to build a tower that goes up to heaven. And when God floods the place out, we have a fire escape. We can go up, we can go up, at, up that tower and get into heaven. God's going to flood out of the hole. God looked down on that mess. Paul, he went down and smit them 
uh, different languages immediately. How people can how people can can go against the uh, the evidence of a Holy Ghost speaking in tongues? I'll never know. They just cannot accept it. But God's done it before. I can't do it again. If you build one house, that, does that mean you can't build another one? If you drive a car, you get your license, you drive it one time. Does that mean when you get out, you can't do it anymore? God's not limited like we are. So we find here, we find here a strange situation. We find people being scattered. And the Chinese race, whose history dates back 4,500 years, for 3,800 years from the time of the Tower of Babel until Marco Polo, People didn't know what was going on on the other side of the Himalayan mountain. People, 3,800 years. Alexander the Great, 30 years old, sat down on a stone, cried like a baby because he didn't have another kingdom to conquer. He tried going over those mountains to the east, but he got halfway up and his, ma his, his army mutinied on him. Here's the strange thing. You look into ancient Chinese history before Taoism came, 500 B.C., before Buddhism came from India, 500 B.C., before Confucius tried to heal the land with his own worldly wisdom, 500 B.C., before this, China did not worship idols. Now, there's not a people on the face of the earth during that time that didn't worship idols. Even the Hebrews couldn't keep their hands off of the incense sticks and worship idols throwing their children in the fire and everything else. But here, here we find uh, Noah in time frame. We, we know that he was a preacher. We know that people were reacting to his message. And we find that there is a people, yellow skin, slanted eyes, black hair, that left that region and went into the far distant regions of the east. We don't know. Did Noah take them? Uh, they evidently had a knowledge of Noah. They knew about him. And they were lived in the same era as Noah. Now, we find that 3,800 years later, there's a man by the name of Marco Polo. He goes to China. He's the only foreigner in, the, in Chinese history to have a civil office. He was the ruler of Shanghai. He was the governor of that great city. He was there for 25 years. He tried to come back to his home in Italy. And the emperor didn't want him to go because he knew too much. But he finally escaped for his life. Now we're talking about somewhere in the, in the 13th uh, uh, the 13th and 14th, 13th and 14th century. At that turn of that century, here's Marco Polo escaping for his life. He goes to Europe. He appears before the king. He shows his court the silk. They think he's been to heaven. Could never saw anything like that. He began to share with them things about that land where he'd been. They use paper money. That's where paper money come from. It didn't come from Washington, D.C. Yeah, George Washington didn't have a thing putting his picture on that. that. That paper money existed thousands of years ago. There was a golden age in China when they didn't worship idols, but God enlightened their mind and gave them special ingenuity to find the mysteries of many things that, that in Europe, when, when we didn't realize... We didn't realize uh, uh, very many things. We, we were still in a, uh, a dwelt in a backward civilization. The Chinese had already had a postal system. They'd already had paper money. They'd already had gunpowder. And uh, Marco Polo took it to Europe. First thing we'd done was just kill people. Shame on us white folks. I can say that. I can get away with it. He told them of a land that flows with fire. Petroleum. He told them of a land. There's a land where the sun never sets. 
I said, he's crazy. He's lost his marble, marbles. He brought the compass. One thing the Chinese did know, north, they knew where north was, and there's a north pole where the sun never sets. This gives us uh, indication we don't have time tonight. The Indian coming from Asia. I can take you, take you to places in Taiwan, mainland China, and Beijing, and I can show you totem poles. I'm going to make a DVD, the culture of China. And it told them poles. You got animals. And at the very top, you got an Indian. I mean, if it don't look like an Indian, you tell me what he is. And he's got two feathers in his head. He's sticking right up there. Remember that, brother? And he's got this, he has these uh, uh, feathers, two feathers. Looks just like an, uh, a, a, a North American Indian brave. There's a lot of them. A lot of them, when they meet, they say how. The Chinese, they say ni hao. Oh. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? We find that. Marco Polo went to Europe. He brought the, the magnifying glass. He, he took it to Italy. And the Italians are w renowned for having the best eyeglasses in the whole world. They have an early start. Praise the Lord. Find that, that there were the printing press that was developed in, in, in Europe, Germany. Our Bible, the Gutenberg Bible, the English Bible were printed. They were, the, the ingenuity of this, where you could take one page and stamp it. You got the whole page. You don't have to write it out letter by letter. And the Chinese had developed their own printing system. Praise the Lord. People, you can go on and on and on. This was a, an era, what the Chinese call their golden age. When they didn't worship idols, they only worshiped God. And they would go out in the far distant regions of, their, of their, the borders of their nation. And the emperor of China would take a lamb and would slay it in front of the God in heaven and pray and ask God to forgive the nation of China for their sins. Hallelujah. Hey, people, these things don't just happen. There's reason. There's history. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody said praise the Lord find that something else came to Italy. It was called Chinese noodles. And they capitalized on it, of course. And we don't call it Chinese noodles today. We go down to a restaurant, the Italian restaurant, we like to eat spaghetti. But before there was spaghetti, the Italians had spaghetti, the Chinese had their noodles. Praise the Lord. We find that, that the history tells us Marco Polo, he cried like a baby on his deathbed. He said, I haven't told half what I know. He said, the things that I know, I couldn't tell nobody because they all say I'm crazy laughing at me. So he withdrew. Amazing. There was a race of people that were highly civilized. And it's amazing. In the book of Isaiah 49 and verse 12, you find the Bible talking about Siddim. They shall come it's prophecies of Jesus. People come to worship him. They shall come from the north. They come from the west. They come from the land of Sinem. Sinem, S-I-N. We, many of our uh, political platforms are called Sino-American relationships, S-I-N. Those three letters are still in the, the, uh, uh, in use today. Sino-American relations comes from the land of Sinem. I believe with all my heart, Magi came from came from, from the east. It took two years to get, get there. Jesus, they, they, they come from China. Conjecture, you know, we can, we can uh, talk about that, but that's just what I, I believe. But what I, point I'm trying to get across here, people, is there is a people that left the Mesopotamian basin. They left Babylon, and they went out into the far distant regions where nobody knew where they was at. 3,800 years and nobody knew what was going on in that part of the world. It's amazing. Now, let me tell you something about this. You get a chance, you find a good chronological chart. And I, I regret that I do not have the chronology chart, the name of this chronology chart. You get the best one you can find. And I'll tell you, there, there's one, it's got 34 pages. You can fold it out page by page and stick it on the wall. And you'll find Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And you'll find... 
You'll find that, 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 that Shem is in the Middle East, Japheth, uh, and, and, and uh, Ham going down into Africa. You can see it. But you take a real close look at that division, and you look at the bottom, and you'll see a broad black line that comes down and goes to the right. And it says Noah, the founder of the Chinese nation and the inventor of the Chinese language. Now, I believe it. I believe that, 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 that God honored those people because they followed Noah. They did not go against him. They did not rebel against his teachings. And they went out into the far distant regions of Asia. And they didn't worship idols. People, that is an amazing fact about the Chinese people. You look at their artifacts, and you see, you see the bulls, you see the lambs, you see the goats. And it's just like Israel. Strange, isn't it? Here... Now we're looking 4,500 years later, and the meanings are still here. These people were law to the God of Noah, and God blessed them for it, opened their minds, and helped them, their intellect, to be able to devise and develop things that we, while we were worshiping idols and, and, and all over Europe and everywhere else, they were there enjoying these gifts of knowledge that God had given to them because they loved God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It wasn't until 2,500 years ago that China fell under a three-pronged attack. Taoism, spiritism, idols, the dragon, Buddhism coming from India. It's a travesty. The righteousness of God. Then you, you have Confucius. Confucius. Say, oh, they don't worship Confucius. Don't you believe one word of it? I see it all the time. People come there, especially students. Students go and pray to, pray to this, this idol for Confucius and ask him for knowledge and all these kind of things. Don't you believe it? It is a religion of sorts. Now, now that we know this and we brought these things to this point, there's a lot of other things. We could go on for hours, but this DVD can't go over an hour. Somehow, we've got to keep it below an hour. I want to show you this last thing. The Chinese people knew the plan of salvation. They knew how to get their sins forgiven, people. I want you to look at this one word. It's written like this. This word is pronounced E. Everybody say E. Okay, we're going to break it down. Just like we did the other ones. We're going to take this word right here. This word is pronounced yang. Everybody say yang. Okay, and it means lamb. We take the word underneath it, and when we put them together, the, the lamb loses its tail, which is no big deal. And this is pronounced war. Everybody say war. And it means me. Okay, me. We have a character here. A lamb over me. The meaning of this character is righteousness. Stop and think. There's nobody good enough to go to heaven. No matter how hard we try. There's no one ever succeeded. Only Jesus. The Bible teaches us when Jesus was walking along the, 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 the Jordan River. Uh, John the Baptist saw him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. And the Bible teaches us, teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and turn. 20, chapter 5 and 21. The Bible teaches us that, that God made him to be sin who knew no sin. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2 and 22 says that uh, he did no sin and there was no guile found in his mouth. Now this is important that, we, that Jesus is sinless. And then we find in, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5 that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. Now, we got to look at the reason behind this, people. Why do we believe in Jesus? Everybody wants to go to heaven. Hey, man, the Buddhists want to go to heaven. Well, they got their perverted ways of going to heaven. They don't want to go to hell. Everybody knows that there's a heaven, heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Even the Muslims want to go to heaven. And they're going to use their perverted way, brutal, uh, savage, savage ways to... to Misle 
their way into heaven. But the Bible teaches us that when Paul was preaching in Romans, he came to declare the righteousness of God. And he that believes on him shall have their sins forgiven. Now, people, let me, let me draw, draw a, 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 a line here. There's a difference in acknowledging the Christian faith as a good religion and believing on Jesus. You acknowledge your Christian uh, religion as a, as a good religion is not going to change you. While this nation is full of men and women and children, families that are building castles. They're building castles because people don't want to give their lives to the Lord. They acknowledge Christianity is a good re religion. They acknowledge why even, even the Muslims acknowledge that Jesus was a good man. But that's not enough. You've got to believe. Hallelujah. And I want you to stand with me right now if you would. Belief, faith has moral virtue. Now remember that. If you, if you can, write that down. Faith has moral virtue. Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. This word, lamb over me, is pronounced like the letter I. But you've got to pronounce it real hard. E. Everybody say E. And what it means is righteousness. Don't try to wash your dirty clothes with dirty water. Your clothes will get dirtier. Don't try, ladies, to wash your, your dishes that you use today with the dishwater you used yesterday. They'll stink. You've got to have something cleaner. You have to have something cleaner than the thing that's been washed to be able to dissolve the sins and the stains and the pollutions of this world. Thank God. God for the blood of Jesus yes. hallelujah and Jesus alone is our righteousness when God looks down from heaven who does he see I'm glad he don't see me first I'm glad I can say I'm covered by the blood of the lamb and when he sees the lamb he sees the blood washing across the tables of my heart I am declared righteous in his sight hallelujah if I'll take a repentant heart and change my ways Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. Yes. Hallelujah. And the Chinese, the characters depict this very character. A lamb. When God looks down from his heaven, he looks down upon me. He sees the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Now, people, let me tell you why we're having this lesson tonight. These characters are called traditional Chinese characters. 4,500 years never changed. Communist China has taken characters and the traditional Chinese characters and simplified them and taken the meanings, taken the, the, the innate structure of, of, of the meanings of these characters and wiped out 4,500 years of history with one stroke. Wiped out the revelation. The Lord said that, that he will leave a witness Hallelujah. Paul said that the Lord God will not leave himself without a witness. And I'm showing this to you tonight, number one, to show you that God must love the Chinese people. They're not that forsaken bunch of idol worshipers worshiping the, the devil and worshiping the dragons. They have a special place in God's heart. It may be because they were so faithful to Noah. And they went with Noah out into the far distance. We got away from that idol worshiping bunch of rebels there in, in Babylon. Hallelujah. I want you tonight, secondly, to know that God has used the United States of America to protect Taiwan militarily. We got a red dragon out there 100 miles from us. And we tonight want to solicit your prayers for Taiwan. Why? Many reasons. We got a church, or churches, if I shall say. But the traditional Chinese characters with the innate meaning of salvation and the history that connects them to Noah has been erased by an atheist government on mainland China. You can't find it. And they have taken the atheism, the atheistic government has taken the characters that meant so much for thousands of years to the Chinese people and has taken the elements of those meanings of those characters 
and has wiped them out with one stroke. People, pray for Taiwan so that in the future, if we have time, however little time we have, that God will use Taiwan to protect this language. Taiwan is the caretaker of the traditional Chinese characters. They do not accept what mainland China has done. Praise God. That way, we can use these as instruments to win the Chinese to the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God forever and ever. And may His blessings, eternal blessings, be upon the race of China. And everybody said amen. 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 Thank you. Hallelujah. Yay. Yeah.